Hello, everyone. Uh, before I start, I think I need to test my mic first. We, you guys, can you guys hear me? Just leave a comment. See whether you guys can hear me or not. Okay, thank you, uh, Dave. Really done. Confirm that. Okay. Okay, are you guys ready to start? Just type ready if you are ready, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who replied. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm Jack. Today, uh, I would like to discuss about how we maximizing passive income in the stock market. Also, uh, revealing the best bank to foster your financial growth. Okay, so let us uh, start. So before everything, uh, just a quick disclaimer. So this seminar is solely for education purpose and should not be considered as a financial advice. Okay. So let us start our discussions. So uh, as of right now, Singapore actually, their average overnight interest rate is at its peak of 3.72% in this high interest rate environment, earning passive income with, sorry, uh, can you guys see my screen? Because I'm sharing my screen. No. No, yes. Give me a moment. Uh. Let me ping my screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes, right? Okay, okay. Okay, great. So actually, Singapore is having their interest rates at 3.72%. So in this high interest rate environment, uh, earning passive income with an interest rate of 7 points. 3.7% should not be very high, as a lot of investment products right now are giving out a good percentage of you. For example, banks are giving out an average of 3.5% of their fixed deposit. However, in the stock markets, I think not many people are implementing passive income strategies. Collecting passive income in the stock market is not that popular and it is not easy to achieve. So let me introduce the passive income you always heard about and how it works in the stock market. So passive income generations in stock market can be achieved through a very straightforward and simple push. It is by purchasing stock every month or every year and hold for long term to benefit from the dividends payout. This strategy involves a time horizon of typically 10 years or even more. So by consistently allocating fund, you can increase your dividend earnings. Naturally, the more money you invest, the greater the potential dividend gain. So you may have a question like, why do we choose to invest in uh, dividend stock that give you around 3 to 4% when the fixed deposit is uh, giving out 3.5% right now? And as we know that actually fixed deposit is much more safer at least your capital is guaranteed. So anyone also have this uh, question in your mind, maybe you can uh, type why, so that uh, I know that you guys also feel curious about these questions. Why dividend stock? Wow, dividend stock is giving like three, three to four percent. We can buy a uh, fixed deposit. We can put Ooh. our money in fixed deposit, right? Why we choose dividend stocks? Ooh. Okay, Dave, thank you about your why. I think you are very curious about that. So, okay, so why do we say that? Uh, why do we invest in a dividend stock? So this is because when we invest in dividend stocks, we would get the dividend every quarter or semi-annually, depending on the company. Yes. Com okay. And 
but don't forget that a good stock will always have the potential for capital appreciations. So by investing in a good dividend stocks, you can enjoy not only the dividends, but also the capital gains when the company is performing well. So you can enjoy a steady cash flow stream from a strong company, at the same time enjoying the upsides in the market, the stock market. So if you can see, uh, let's say in 2016, when you invest uh, DBS, so 2016, the bank is around, the price of the bank is around 16 to 20. So let's say you started this strategy uh, at, on 2016, then you will gain, uh, every year you will gain around three to 4% of dividend yield. At the same time, you are enjoying uh, the capital appreciations uh, given by the company itself. So like DBS, if you buy around 20, 2016 at around, I can say uh, maybe $20. So now, right now it's 30. So actually you earn uh, not only the 3.5% from the dividends, but also the capital's appreciation. So of course, uh, before we invest all this, uh, we also need to know that uh, how to we pick a good stock like DBS and the potential of the uh, stocks and all the fundamental that are from the stock. So this is also a very crucial thing. Okay, so uh, furthermore, to increase more our uh, potential gain, we can reinvest the dividend to increase our potential gains, reinvest in another valuable techniques that can effectively enhance returns over time. So rather than uh, trading dividend as a source of income to be withdrawn, reinvesting them back into the portfolio can generate a compounding in effect. So this compounding process can lead to snowball effects, gradually uh, increase the size of the investments and consequently boosting the overall passive income generated. So uh, reinvesting the dividend is something like you get the dividend, then you reinvest back. So you make your portfolio bigger and bigger over time. So after maybe five to 10 years, your portfolio will be uh, growing in a very fast pace. And with the compound interest, uh, you will get more and more. So actually, uh, it may sound very boring and not mesh in this uh, rapidly changing market. Why should we invest in dividend stocks for passive income when investing in high growth stock is much more profitable? So investing in dividend stock that provide passive income can act as a hedge against inflation as company generated profit and increase their dividend payment over time. The income received from this stock may rise along with inflation. So this can help us maintain purchasing power and protect against the eruptions of values caused by inflation. Besides that, uh, dividend pay, paying company often has a bit more stability compared to non-dividend payment counterparty. So those uh, who are running their business and have a loss, it's very unlikely they can pay dividend as the they don't have much cash to give out dividends. So usually, a uh, company that pay dividends should be a good company and they have a good fundamental to support. Usually, like, okay, so there's also some exceptional, but mostly we can see uh, normally uh, the stable company will give out dividends and some small or medium growth company will not give, their, uh, give out dividends because of their business is not that mature compared to the other uh, big companies like DBS, like all the banks, because their business is already developed and there's cash cow. They are cash cow. They are able to support this dividend payments. Okay, so by looking at a uh, dividend payment, company can be a uh, Company that pay dividend actually is a sign of a company confident in their future prospect. These stabilities can be attractive to uh, people who are conservative or income focused investors who prioritize steady returns and 
lower risk level. So dividend stock can provide diversification benefit to an investment portfolio by including dividend payment company from various sectors and industry. Investors can spread their risk and reduce exposures to any single stocks or industry. So this diversify can be a cushion against market volatilities and provide a more stable investment performance. So uh, after we saying uh, why do we invest in dividend payment and all the benefit then uh, generate from dividend payment. So we also need to know things to be aware of when we want to implement these strategies to invest in dividend stocks. So it is crucial uh, to acknowledge that this approach uh, requires patience and long-term perspective. So accumulate the accumulations of dividends and the compound, compounding effect they tend to materialize and produce substantial results. It is uh, essential to resist the temp temptations of short-term gain and focus on the bigger picture. So I think this is why the strategy is not so popular and it's very hard to achieve because when you are doing this uh, strategy, when you want to invest long-term, when you want to invest in dividend payment, it is very painful for us when we see the stock price drop to 20% or more. So you will be very panicked and wanted to sell the shares out. Even they are giving a good, uh, good rate of dividends, but all the bad news and all the, all the price drop will scare you out. So this is the, I think it's the most common things the public will do. Uh. So they think they want to uh, invest in the long term, but when the price drop, they will somehow sell it. So this is uh, defeat the purpose of investing in the dividend stock. Uh. So by implementing this strategy, we need to understand the fundamental of the stocks and also the reason why do we do uh, invest the dividend stocks. First, when we decide to implement uh, this stock and choose a dividend stocks, our time horizons need to be long term. And it's like uh, saving your money in a bank, but in a different way, which is uh, saving it into stocks. Second, we need to ensure that the stock we invest in have a good potential and stable business models. You wouldn't want to invest in something like small risky company if you don't see the futures of the company, right? For long term, maybe for short term, uh, the answer may be yes, but for long term, I think everyone want to invest in, in something that are stable, that generate a great amount of dividend for us, right? So uh, we want to choose a strong and potential company to invest in. So maybe you will ask, uh, when can we sell the shares? In this case, I would not suggest selling the share if the company is constantly giving you a stable dividend at and has a very strong fundamental and economic mode. So, uh, however, if the company stop paying dividends or its fundamental are getting worse, which uh, might impact their business directly, then I think this is the time you need to consider exiting or choosing another stock that has better fundament. So I can give example. So if you can see this uh, stock you choose is performing very well, their prospect is very good. Their future is very good. Dividend payment also constantly growing. Then this uh, might not be a chance for you to like sell it out, right? Because you are getting a stable in income dividends from them. If the company is very, uh, always have a loss and the stop paying dividend, then you will not, you're not getting any dividend from that. Then I think it's time for you to think about it and whether you want to choose another stocks to buy. So I can see Anthony Bissabek. Besides bank and risk, actually uh, when we, in Singapore, uh, actually bank and risk is the main thing. Uh. Of course, there's others, others uh, company like Kepler DC or that. So, but mainly today I will talk about bank and 
about risk, I will also talk about a little bit, but uh, we can uh, go deeper on that maybe later. So uh, of course, not all company offer dividend and those that do, do uh, may vary dividend policies and payment frequency. So we should truly research and analyze stock before making an investment decisions, in evaluating a company financial health, dividend histories, and overall market condition can aid in selecting stock with the higher probabilities of, of providing sustainable and consistent dividends. So the stock market offer a viable avenues for generating passive income through long-term dividends investing. By adopting a patience and discipline approach, you can wrap the benefit of compounding return, while it may require time and effort. So the potential for long-term financial growth and consistent passive income stream will make this approach a more attractive option for many investors. Okay, so before that, are you guys uh, interesting in, interested in this strategy? Are you looking for something to do uh, to have a stable dividends income? Maybe you can comment below. In this uh, situation, I think the high interest rate situation, maybe some might not really uh, into dividend stocks. Maybe you guys can uh, comment below and let me know. And about Anthony questions, I think for Singapore, I will suggest you mean uh, focus on bank and REITs lah, because this is what Singapore market main, is mainly famous for and what is very strong, uh, Singapore is strong in bank and their property. So it is, uh, I recommend is uh, you can focus more on these two sector. Other will be also have some good, good uh, company, but it may be a little bit uh, weaker than these two industry. Okay. So maybe the second slide you can see. If you can see actually Singapore market is mainly focused for its bank and REITs. So based on the STI component, the three main banks in Singapore, which is a DBS, OUOB and OCBC have 46.41% of the weightage in the STI index. And I think this is the stronger industry in the Singapore's market and worth investing in. So according to a uh, three times, Singapore has overtaken Hong Kong to become Asia's top set financial center and the third in the world. So in this case, I think the bank industry in Singapore has a lot more potential than the other industry in the future. Because given that uh, Singapore have the financial, is a financial centers and they are top three right now. So I think the future of Singapore in the financial industry is uh, way more better than compared with others industry. Of course, in the Singapore market, REITs also have a lot of potential. Both bank and REITs are giving out a good percentage of dividend yield to their shareholder. But today I will focus more on bank. Uh, this is because I think that property market would not be would be under a lot of pressure in this high interest rate environment. So uh, why do I say so? So you can see that uh, actually when the interest rate is high, borrowing costs will become more expensive. So which can reduce the affordabilities of the mortgage. So in this case, uh, if the interest rate is high, public like us uh, have a lesser chance to buy a house. In reason. And also this uh, in turn will tamp down the demand for buying property from the public, particular among potential first-time home buyers or those with limited budget. So for property investors often rely on that uh, often rely on financials to acquire financings to acquire and maintain their property. When interest rate uh, go up, the cost of borrowing increase which can reduce their profitabilities of investment property. This may lead to a slowdown in property investment activity and a decrease in property price. So property trust company also would slow down their investment plans, such as their expanding plan as their cost in, is, is, is increasing. 
So it is hard for them to refinance their portfolio in this high interest rate environment. I think that it should not be the time to end the rates for long-term investment, as we do not know how long the high interest rate environment will remain. If the high interest rate remain at the high level for a longer period, it could affect the property market a lot. So this correction, uh, the price will be correct correction. Uh, it will de decline in property price as demand weaker when the interest rate is going up, and which is leading to potential slowdown in sales activity. Thus, I think now is still not the time to invest in REITs for passive income. As we know that to earn passive income, it will need to be a long-term investment. So Singapore REITs right now is more suitable for uh, short-term investments or swing trading. So, but this topic will belong to the other next time we can talk about. So if you guys are interested in this topic, maybe you can comment below and let me know. Comment reads below. So next time we can uh, host another webinar talk about reads. Yep. So uh, next I will be sharing the three banks in Singapore and comparing their uh, their finance ratios. So as you can see, DBS from our Philip analyst. The target price is 41, 41.6 and potential upside of 33.1%. And their business segment is, uh, you can see actually the business segment is mainly in, in, in this institutional banking and consumer banking and well management. Okay. And you can see on the this uh geography geography segment will be DBS uh their profit is actually mainly generating from Singapore which has sixty five percent revenue is covered from Singapore and eighteen percent will be Hong Kong and seven percent will be uh Southeast Asia and seven percent will be Greater China so in this geography we can see actually DBS as a very concentration uh, geography revenue generating from Singapore. Okay, so I will share about uh, the recent update of DBS. So during the DBS investor days on 2020, May 20 uh, this year, where management share their prospect for the company, their guidance of midterm three to five ROE is 15 to 17. As their light capital business, such as well management, global transaction service and treasury market sales are growing fast. A baseline of their dividends also increased by 0 0.25 uh, to four per year and further upsides of three billions of the optimal CT1 operating range will be distributed to future ordinary dividend set up, special dividend or share buybacks. So from the investor, investor days of DBS, we can find that actually DBS has very strong guidance for the futures that it is what we are looking for when we choose a company to invest in. So uh, later on, I will be comparing uh, the financial ratio with three other banks, including uh, DBS. So which, and we will see which one is suitable for your style of investing. So let us look at the target price and uh, analysis rating. Analyst rating. So you can see actually there's four buy and one neutral and one hold. Okay. So when we look at the analyst rating, since we are doing a long term investment, so why do we look at the analyst rating? Because I want to see. Actually, analyst rating is something like what the market is looking at on this company. So when there's four, four company rating buy, one company rating neutral and one is whole, then I think this is a uh, normal and doesn't have a really bad news or anything from DBS. 
So when I do a first screening, I will look at this. If let's say there's a lot of cell, a lot of hole, and doesn't have buy, then I think that might, that that will be a red flag for me, and I will go deeply inside what is happening. Why does the analyst a uh, red cell, and why the why do they say so? So actually, this will be a very good indicator for us to screen the shares. Of course, this is the first basic. Uh, it's not that detailed, but uh, anyhow, we can still know something from here. So in this case, you can see DBS got four buy and one whole one neutral. So this could be a good sign, I can say. So the the analyst is uh, looking good. Looking uh, at DBS is a good perspective on this. And next, we will see the important thing, the most important things we are looking at is the dividend. So first, when I look at the dividend, I will look at their growth rate. So usually I will not look at a uh, dividend yield first. I will look at dividend per share. So is a uh, cost dividend yield will affect by their price, but dividend per share, we can see whether they are growing, they are giving out more dividend over the years or not. So if you can see 2016 is DBS is giving 0 0.6 set up uh, six and 0 uh, 0.2017 is given by given to 0 0.93. And following, there's a, actually is increasing their dividend, which is a good sign. But until 2020, which is the COVID year, so it dropped. So this one, I think, is a assumption. So I will not see this one because uh, COVID is not every year you will see this happen. So I will accept this, then get back to 2021 and 2022. So actually the dividend per shares is growing. So I can say it's healthy for me. And by looking at dividend you, so for dividend you actually, uh, I think it's something like, it's a guidance for you. So what you expect to get. Uh, so when we see the lowest is 3.46 and during COVID is 3.47. So I, can, I, I will usually set this as a baseline because 2020 will be the COVID time and the economy is very bad. Everyone have a uh, no job, uh, then lockdown and everything. So the economy is actually is, is at a very bad situation. So they are still managed to pay around 3.47% of their dividends. The dividend is still given 3.47, which means I think next time this will be the baseline so we can estimate when you invest in uh, DBS, your yield will be around 3.5, 3.4 uh, to 5, around 3.4 to 5. So this is uh, how, how I see the dividend yield and dividend per share. But the most important thing is the dividend per share. Uh, so we need to see whether the dividend per share is growing or not. This is the more important. Of course, the dividend yield is important, but this is uh, it will be affected by the price you buy, you get into. So next, we can look at uh, the DBS technical analysis. Uh, analysis. So when you can see uh, right now is thirty one. So let's say if you ask me where to enter, first I will look at the support line of the company. The first support line will be 29.61, but this one will be a bit uh, not that conservative, I can say. If you are long-term buyer, then I will suggest at the 27 will be the entry price. Of course, you can buy at 29. If you think you, you, you are fear of missing out, then of course, 29 will be also a good uh, support line for those who willing to take risk, willing to uh, buy a bit higher. Okay, so when, when we talk about dividend stock, I would like to buy at cheaper price instead of buying the high price. Like, like let's say normally when we do a short term, short term investment, uh, we will look at 32. If the, if the price is break to 32, then we will go inside and buy, follow the trend. But for dividend, 
uh, dividend stock and long term investment. I would like to buy something at a cheaper cheaper price, and at the support line. Yeah. So this is uh how I invest in the dividend stocks. So moving forward, we will look at UOB. So we can look at actually Philip is giving a target price at 35.7 and the, there is a potential upside of 27%. So actually it is uh, very good. And the business segment for UOB actually is 54% of group wholesale bankings and 35 for group retails. For the geography segment will be mainly also in Singapore, 58% revenue is generating from Singapore. And other countries such as other Asian Pacific, Malaysia and Thailand will be 13%, 11% and 9%. So you can see actually UOB also mainly focused on Singapore and the other Asian Pacific. I can say Malaysia and Thailand is ASEAN. Lah. Okay. So a uh, recent update of the UOB uh, will be UOB have acquired the Citibank, Citibank Consumer Bank, uh, Consumer Bank, yeah. So this actually is something that they are trying to acquire uh, Singapore, uh, Citibank, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam branch on consumer business. So it allowed UOB to access, accelerate, skill up and deepen its ASEAN franchise. So in this case, it has actually increased their market share of UOB in consumer banking in ASEAN, which could be a good sign for bank to expand their business in this market. So when we look at uh, the analyst ratings and target price, we can see actually there's three buy and three hold. So by comparing with UOB and DBS, actually you can see that actually the market will be uh, side DBS more because I don't know, but uh, DBS actually, I think it's more, more like the top, top bank in Singapore compared with UOB. So DBS is actually more favorable for the citizen of Singapore. And also for the market, they also know that. So actually you can see, usually DBS is uh, stronger than UOB uh, in this case. And when we look at dividend of UOB, actually their dividends comparing with UOB and DBS actually is uh, much uh, uh, similar. So we can look at dividend per share. 2016, they are giving 70 cents. Then 17, uh, 2017 will be $1 and moving forward 1.2, 1.3. And up until now is 1.35. So actually it's also very healthy. We can see the growing is there. And look at the dividend yield. During COVID time is around 3.45 and 2016 is 3.43 so i can say this baseline is around 3.4 percent uh i think it's almost very similar both the bank dbs and uob okay anthony talk about the payout ratio considered as sustainable because of they are going up for payout ratio actually i think the bank will be around 40 to 50 percent when we can look back on uh, UOB, uh dbs we can look back the payout ratio actually also the same is around uh 40 to 50 percent on average lah. so i think this is normal and from here we does not see anything but this one will be as a benchmark we can see if the bank is around 40 to 50 then i think this is a normal thing uh is we can see this normal yeah so looking forward to the technical analysis
So we can see actually UOB right now is 28. So the next uh, support level will be 27. And more conservative will be 25 and 24. So I think if for me, the better price would be 25 to 24 for long-term investment. For someone who uh, is more aggressive, they can go for 27 because this is a quite a strong support line, but I like 25 better. Okay. So moving forward would be OCBC, OCBC Bank. So if you can see OCBC Bank, uh, our Philips research is have a target price on at 14.96 and potential ups of 20.8. So the business segment will be 41% of global wholesale bank and 35% of global consumer private banking. Okay, so for the geography segment will be Singapore. Revenue is from 58% and 14% Malaysia and 13% from China and Indonesia is nine. So if you can see a difference, actually OCBC have a uh, greater China uh, business, business from greater China. So I think this is uh, quite a thing. So when you want to invest in OCBC, you must take this into account because of China actually is a double sort thing. Invest in China is actually double sort. So the growth rate of China is very good. And uh, we, as we know that actually China is the second strongest country in the world right now. Maybe they're going to be the first or maybe they are not. So this will be the uh, point that you invest. It will be riskier compared with the others uh, bank because they have 13% from China. And the geopolitical is actually quite uh, intense in China because of there's so many things up there and they are compete with US. Yeah, so this is a double sort. So for people who are who like more growth rate, I think OCPC will be one of the choice. Lah. And also their directions of uh, that their direction on their business actually OCBC aim to capture rising Asian wealth and support increasing uh, mainland China, Hong Kong, and Asian ASEAN Greater China flow to deepen its regional present, uh, presence and drive sustainable growth. So OCBC see a golden opportunity in mainland China, Hong Kong, and ASEAN Greater China. So investment flow be between Greater China and the ASEAN re regions are looking robust, particularly since uh, China's reopening post-COVID. So mainland China and ASEAN countries are experiencing rapid, rapidly economic growth driven by factors such as urbanization, increased consumer spending and expanding middle-class populations. So by facilitating a financial flow between this market, OCBC can gain access to high growth opportunities and also benefiting uh, from the economic progress in the regions. Uh. So as what I can say, uh, this is a double sort thing, uh, it's double sort. So they have a very op good opportunity for the growth rate, but also they are risking a uh, risk having So for people who uh, want to consider to buy OCBC, please take into account on this. Because their, their direction is going to expand their business in China. So besides focusing on multiple market and customer segment, it can uh, help uh, OCBC to diversify its risk exposures by expanding its operation beyond a single market uh, such as Singapore. So let us see the analyst ratings. So we can see actually uh, four buy, two hold. So there's no risk fact from this. And it's, I can say, average rating from 
by comparing DBS, OCBC, and UOB, all their rating actually is very similar. Cause uh, I I don't think there's any uh, bad news from this three bank recently lah. That's why all the rating is average. So nothing more can say this about analyst ratings. So moving to the dividends your OCBC is giving. So as, as you can see, the dividend uh, from 2016 is 0.36, then 2017 grow to 0.37, then 2018 will be 0.43. So if, okay, you can see 2016 and 2017, they only grow uh, one cent. So this may be not a good thing for me, but uh, looking forward, they actually, right now the dividend is paying 0 0.68. So I think it's still reasonable, but okay. So if you look at the dividend, you then you will know that actually OCBC, they are pay, paying dividend their U, dividend U is actually lower compared with UOBs and also DBS. So the baseline of the U, OCBC will be around 2.99% up to 4. Point dividend U. So actually from the dividend pay up and everything, we can see that actually UOB has a more risk and DBS will be the most stable one giving up the uh, dividends. Okay, so when we look at the technical analysis, the price right now is at 12.43. The support line will be 12. And actually I can see there's a lot of support uh, line, but for me, I draw 11.31 because I think OCBC is much more riskier than the other two banks. That's why I put a lower price for if for me, I will uh, enter at 11.31 or 10.91. So because of their volatile volatility, as you can see, the graph actually is more volatile than the other two. Yeah. About the question you guys asked, uh, I will try to answer after this webinar because uh, there's some time constraints for, for me. So I, I think I will try to answer everyone. Okay. So after looking at the recent update and uh, of the Singapore banks and their business direction in the future, I think that OCBC have a lot more potential in terms of grow, grow rate as it will expand its it business in mainland China and ASEAN countries. So apart from this, UOB is also trying to expand its market shares by the acquisitions of city consumer business in several countries in ASEAN. Personally, I think China has more potential in terms of grow, grow rate. Lah. As we know that actually China actually is rising very fast and they are now top two in the world. So China has a lot of potential. Of course, they also have risk on that. So because of the geopolitical of the China's are not that stable. So last is DBS. I think DBS will be more stable as DBS is mainly focused on its business in Singapore and looking to strengthen its own economic modes and fundamentals. So by looking at their recent update, I think DBS will be the most stable company uh, but also they are too concentrated in Singapore. So if you think Singapore economy will be very good, then DBS will be one of the best choice for you. For you, OCBC will have a more grow rate in the future, but with higher risk. So I think OCBC will be much more suitable for someone who uh, seek for more capital appreciations instead of dividend yield. Of course, uh, three banks are giving around three to uh, four percent yield. So, uh, this is for you to choose and see where which bank actually is suit your style more. So, by looking at their recent update, is actually not 
enough to determine. So let us look at their financial ratio and data, see what we can get from there. So I have uh, get all the information and try to arrange it for you guys. So I have made this uh, graph, I can say graph, and the data is from 2018. So yes, let us look at this. So when we look at net income, net income, we can see actually net income, DBS have the highest net income among the other two. So I can say by comparing these three, DBS is the best bank for the net income. And for the non-interest, uh, non-interest income, DBS also have the most net uh, non-interest income. So for the net interest income, yeah. So I highlighted UOB because of uh, I think it's quite good because of when you see 2018, they are uh having 6.2 billion, then 19 6.6, then when COVID that drops uh around six million, 600 million, uh 60 million sorry, and then they grow, so actually. Is very healthy for this. Of course, DBS also, but uh, when you see their growth rate now, uh, UOB actually have more stable growth rate, like in terms of drop and increase. Uh, if you look at DBS, actually, they have uh, 8 billion, 9 billion, then drop to 9 again. Then 2021 is dropping again. So it might not be uh, so much better than UOB. Uh. Okay, and we look at net interest margin. Actually, net interest margin, you OCBC this year is giving up. Uh, their net interest margin is actually quite high. So this is what I like for OCBC. And also, uh, I can their forecast for OCBC actually this year they are going up to two percent and more. So the uh OCBC will. I think OCBC, their net interest margin will be uh, better. Uh, moving forward to this all ratio, I think is quite important. And also ratio that we can learn something from. So maybe you guys not really familiar with uh, what the ratio is about. So I have uh, put the definitions of the, the ratio. So maybe I can explain it a little bit. So for cost to income, so it's cost to income is also known as a effic efficiency ratio measure, how effect efficient a bank is being run. So basically cost to income is like, uh, you use how many money to earn $1. So let's say DBS, the cost to income is 43 uh, last year. So they use 0 0.43 cents to earn a $1. So this is how it's work. So the lesser, of course, the better. And for CASA ratio will be uh, used by consumer for daily banking. And okay, so CASA ratio, CASA account is actually uh, used by consumer for daily banking and saving in their account that don't really give much uh, interest. The usual account that give you 0.005% interest. Uh. So if let's say the more people put inside this uh, bank account, meaning that they have lesser cost, cost F, uh, fixed deposit actually is giving up around 3 to 4%, right? But if you uh, store inside the normal banking, normal banking account, uh, then they don't really give you interest. So in in the bank side, it's actually is very good things when you put in uh, the CASA account instead of fixed deposit. Because fixed deposit, they have a cost around 3%. But CASA account, they only give you a very little percentage. So when, when we can see on DBS, UOB and OCBC, DBS have, have the highest CASA ratio. So means actually, we can know that actually uh, Singaporeans like to use DBS more compared with the others. So they like to save more bank, uh, save more money inside the bank. 
like and use PayLa or anything to uh, store their money. La. So this is how we look at CASA ratio. So of course, the more the better. So we can see actually DBS is the highest among these two banks. Okay, so moving forward to the loan to deposit ratio. So loan to deposit is uh, used to understand that bank liquidity situations. The ratio is calculated by DB, dividing the total loan by total deposit. So a loan is considered to be a uh, so loan to deposit ratios. When we see, uh, of course, the loan must be lesser than the deposit. So it it will uh, prevent like bank run. So let's say if the bank is using uh high uh money more than the deposit, uh, means they are uh using future money or money that are not exiting in their bank. So of course need to be, uh, this ratio need to be under 100 and the lesser the better. So we can see actually DBS have the lesser, which is much more, uh, is stronger than the other two. And next will be LP, NPL. NPL is a uh, non-performing loans. So this, uh, we can say it's a bad, bad debt. Blah. So the lesser, the better, of course. So DBS also win at this uh, ratio. Okay. So, but actually they, these three banks actually have a quite low non-performing loans, which is acceptable. And for CET1, it's actually a component of tier one capital, which consists of the best quality capital, such as, uh, common stocks and retained earnings under the regulations of the MS and everything. The minimum requirement for the CET is uh, is 4.5%. So they all is much more higher. So uh, just make things clear. CET, the, the, much, uh, the higher the better. Right? Okay, just remember this if you don't really know what I mean. By CET, but actually CET is a quite important uh, ratio to look at whether uh, on the fundamentals of the banks. And ROE, ROE, I, I hope everyone knows what's ROE. So it's return of equity. The, the highest, the better, of course. And also uh, a lot of other company besides bank, you will need to use this also. So this is very uh, important ratio to look at. So of course the much, the, the highest, the better. So DBS will be at the highest at 15%, which is higher than both three. So by concluding uh, this, this, tri uh, this ratio, we can see actually DBS have win a lot on their ratio. Their CASA ratio, their loan to deposits, their non-performing loans, their ROE, as well as their net income, everything they actually have, we can see actually it's top, top la in Singapore bank. So in conclusion, uh, DBS will be the first option for me when I want to invest in dividend stocks because it is more stable and the dividend is giving up a, a from three to 4%. And I think the ratios of the, the bank, the DBS is very good. And also uh, we, I, we can send the biggest bank in Singapore, right? So actually uh, very depending in the Singapore's uh, economy. Singapore is going good. Uh, the economy is going uh, higher and DBS also will benefit from that. For OCBC, I think it is much more riskier and the growth rate might, might be uh, better because of their uh, business directions. Yeah, so uh, this will be my end of uh, sharings for the banks and my opinions on that. Lah. So uh, the recording we will be sending to our Telegram channel. Uh, feel free feel free to join our Telegram channel. So our Telegram channel actually will be sharing a lot of insights from us. And not only SG, we will be sharing uh, 
US shares and the updates. And every Friday, we will host a Teddy live and answer all the questions you guys have. And we try to make it more interactive with uh, our audience. So if you got any questions that uh, regarding on the investment, uh, US, Singapore, Hong Kong, feel free to join here and ask us. And also if you want to have some weekly update uh, on shares and have some tips from us, then I think you must join our Telegram channel. So here is our QR code so you can join this and we'll be sharing the link for you guys. Yeah in the webinar chats. Okay, so let me look at the questions you guys are asking. Sir. Okay, next will be, uh, we got uh, promotions on our newly launched MT5. So you get, at per airport, if you fulfill the criteria. Lah. So you can see, you're entitled to reward on the total amount of initial funding. So if you fund in 1,500 plus five trade, five buy or sell trade, you will get 50 CFT trading credits. And if you fund in a, deposit uh, 5,000, you will get uh, $50 of grab voucher and 250 CFT trading credits. And the platinum welcome gift will be if you deposit 30,000 and have a 50 buy or sell trade, you entitled for an airport and 500 trading credit. So you can join, uh, you can scan the QR code or click the link at our chat site to join this. And if you want to open an account, you can also scan this. So let me look at the question right now after this, all these uh, account openings and promotions we are giving you guys. Uh. Look at that all three bank card dividend in 2020. Okay, so uh, by answering uh, Liu, Liu Wai Leong, are we using financials one year VS five year PE and PB ratios? So for PE ratios, uh, I think that actually for Singapore Bank actually using PE ratio is not that useful because you can see actually the PE ratios is not that uh, informative. For PB, yes, I will use one year and five years. Uh, maybe I can give you an example. Give me a moment. Maybe I can give examples on PB. So in this case, yeah. So for PB, I will look at the average. Uh, of course, the book value per share will. Uh, I will look at it whether the price will be at the book above the book value or not. So as of right now, actually OCBC is above the book value, and which is actually very normal because usually most of the time UOB is above the book value and it is below the blue color is me median price. So for the book value, I look at the average uh, book value price, which is the median. So you can see actually the median is the blue color line, this one. So this one will be a bit technical. Lah. So yes. 
for me, I will look at the median price and uh, one standard deviation above PB and uh, one standard deviation lower. Yep, for PB. So for, can dividend stock replace bond in an investment portfolio? I can say actually, this two actually is a different set of asset. So if you buy bond, you are looking for capital guarantee because they're giving you back the capitals and you gain uh, dividends. But for stock, uh, you are having dividend gains and also capital gains. So actually these two, I think you need to be separating these two concepts. This is not the same. Because uh, for me, I think these two have to be separate and also cannot be replaced because shares cannot be replaced on bond. And, and also actually bond is really depending on the interest rate. So when the interest rate is going up, the price of the bond will always go down. And why was so when the interest rate going down, the price will go down up. So actually a uh, bond market uh, don't really affected by the stock market or all the bad news. Like let's say the bank bankrupt, uh, don't say bank bankrupt, let's say COVID time. So economy is getting affected. So the bond, the bond market might go down a little bit, but the stock market will be going down a lot. So the volatilities of the stock market and the bond are really different. So, so you cannot, uh, we cannot make it the same thing because both things are different and both have their own market and their core relationship is actually, if I buy bond, I will treat it as a, the other asset classes, the other one. So stock will be one. Uh, bond will be one. So I don't think we can uh, replace dividend stock no, with the, yeah. So any, any questions more? Maybe I can try answer one or two. Everyone good to go? Maybe you can text something so I can reply. Oh, sorry. I think no, one more question I didn't, did not answer. Can you elaborate on the difference between DBS Institution Bank and UOB OCBC Wholesale Bank? Okay, actually, Wholesale Bank and Institutionals is in the institutional is mainly the segment and whole uh let me check let me check for you let me stop sharing first uh. to stop sharing Okay, I think this one I will get back to you on this la. So, uh, maybe you can uh, feel free to join our Telegram channel and I will try to answer this question later on. Thank you, Wen Jie Liang. Sorry, I think there's a Q&A. Is Pronex a good company for dividend? Uh, for me, I think not really actually Pronex, yeah. Compare with, if comparing with the DBS, uh, I think DBS is much more stable and the capi capital appreciation is okay. Dividend is stable. 
So Pronex is actually a very much more riskier because the price is more fluctuated, is more riskier. And the dividend itself is not that stable. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for every everyone joining our section. So I'll be uh we'll be end this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kim Yang. Thank you, Dave. Feel free to join our Telegram channel. We'll be sharing more on that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.